excited about this. Um, this event is a special one for us here at the Institute. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I'm excited about it. First, it's the inaugural event of a new center on campus, the Center for Human Rights. And uh, we're just super thrilled um, that this is starting here at the Catholic University and that Bill Saunders um, has joined us in that effort. And that's the second reason why I'm excited. Bill joined the Institute about a year ago, and he's been an enormous asset to us, to what we're doing at, at the Institute he brings. Among the things he brings is uh, an acute legal mind, he's Harvard Law trained, um, he brings a network of friends like uh, Robbie, who's brought to us tonight, and he brings energy and passion for human rights. Much of his career has been spent advocating um, on behalf of vulnerable populations um, internationally and nationally. So thank you and, and welcome. Um, yeah, I, I'm very excited about tonight, uh, very excited about the, the future of this new Center for Human Rights here at Catholic University and this new Master of Arts in Human Rights, will, which will be uh, uh, administered in our School of Arts and Sciences, but it's truly an interdisciplinary program um, across, across the university that takes advantage of, of, our, uh, of our very nature as a global Catholic research university with comprehensive programs in, in law and canon law and sociology and anthropology in the business school. Um, really, it's, it's a unique thing that's not being done elsewhere and it's, uh, it's because of who we are. We're more free as a, uh, as a faithful Catholic research university uh, to approach the truth um, from this foundation of where the truth uh, flows from, and that's God, um, and the centrality of the human person in, embedded in human rights, um, we can look at it in a way that's more complete because of this freedom um, that comes through obedience to the church uh, as a university. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm looking forward to working uh, with Bill on this um, as, we, as we grow it. We're kicking it off today with a, with a press release, and we'll be um, recruiting students to, uh, to start next fall. So thank you, I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation and um, uh, enjoy. Uh, welcome also, uh, I'm Bill Saunders for those of you who haven't met me yet. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Robert George, who most of you I'm sure know, but he is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton. He is the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. Um, he was formerly the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, a member of the President's Council on Bioethics, and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. His law degree is from Harvard. We actually went to school together. I won't tell you which of us did better. Uh, <laughs> and his uh, Ph.D. is from Oxford. And perhaps most important, he's on my advisory board for this Center for Human Rights. So, Robbie, welcome. Thank you, Bill. Thank all of you. Thank you. So this event is uh, in, in, in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so we want to first ask ourselves, uh, is it something worth celebrating? I mean, why are we celebrating it? What, what's it all about? Many of you may know it. Uh, some of you scholars, et cetera, may have studied it, but some of you may be new to it. So I want to first just quote Benedict XVI, who 10 years ago at the United Nations, at the 60th anniversary of the Declaration. It was actually issued on December the 10th, but this is the 70th year. Anyway, he spoke at the United Nations, and he called the Universal Declaration the outcome of a process which placed the human person at the heart of institutions, laws, and the workings of society. So perhaps I'll ask Robbie uh, just to start off by what, asking him, what do we have to celebrate here with the Universal Declaration? Thank you, Bill, and uh, I'll certainly be happy to uh, launch our discussion of that question. But before I do that, if you could indulge me, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you here at Catholic University of America for the opportunity to be here. I have enormous admiration for this institution. It's truly a faithful and great Catholic uh, university. I admire the leadership of John Garvey and Andrew Abella and Dean Dominguez and Joe Capizzi and uh, 
uh, others who uh, are taking this university, as far as I can see, uh, to great new heights of scholarship and uh, teaching. So congratulations on all you do. I'm also very excited about the new master's degree program in human rights. There are human rights degree programs, including master's degree programs, at a lot of different places, but I think this institution will really bring something new to the table, and that is an understanding of human rights rooted in the deep tradition of thought that takes us back to Athens and to Jerusalem, uh, a, a, an approach to human rights that really anchors human rights in truths about the human person and the flourishing of the human person, the goods of the uh, human person. Deep stuff. Uh, but if we're going to understand human rights correctly and if we're going to have a sound basis for affirming and upholding and acting on behalf of human rights, then we need that kind of deep understanding. So Bill, I'm excited uh, about what you're doing. And I congratulate you, Dean Dominguez, and the entire leadership of Catholic University for bringing this program. I hope that uh, some of you in the audience who are younger and, and uh, some who are watching us uh, on the live stream uh, who are thinking about their own academic futures and are interested in human rights will consider the possibility of enrolling uh, in the new master's degree program uh, in human rights here at the Catholic University of America. Bill warned me not to push that too hard because uh, they don't want to be flooded uh, at the beginning. They'll, they'll start with a smaller class and, and, and build from there. But uh, that's how excited, really, I am about the program. Uh, and then at the risk of embarrassing uh, Bill, I will mention not only that he is my godson, uh, who was received into the Catholic Church uh, uh, after uh, we got to be friends at uh, Harvard and I had the honor of uh, sponsoring him, uh, but uh, this man, who really should be featured tonight, we should be switching chairs here on a, in a discussion of human rights, uh, this man is genuinely a human rights hero, a person who has literally put his body, put his life on the line, upholding human rights in very dangerous places like the southern Sudan. Bill will remember, he won't tell you about it, uh, he's too modest, I will, uh, that he uh, literally um, was bombed. Um, he, he was subjected to uh, aircraft bombing uh, when he uh, was with a group of Sudanese uh, Christians at Christmas time uh, a number of, uh, of years ago. Uh, Bill knew he was going into a terribly unsafe area, and he went there more than once, but to stand in solidarity and to support people who were victims of terrible uh, human uh, rights abuses. So, uh, so Bill, now that I've... Uh, now that I've uh, embarrassed you, I hope you'll uh, forgive me, but it, it, it's some indication of why it's such a special honor for me to be up here with, uh, with Bill Saunders. Why should we be celebrating uh, the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights? Because it's an extraordinary achievement. It's a document that brought together people of many, many different faiths and shades of belief to make a statement of common ground, and not just a least common denominator sort of approach, but to make a profound statement of the dignity of the human person, the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of the human person, and an affirmation of the rights that human beings have, not in virtue of any special trait, strength, beauty, intelligence, social standing, but simply in virtue of their humanity. If we look at the long course of human events, that's not something people have been all that eager to affirm. The strong are not always so eager to affirm the equal dignity and human rights of the weak. The brilliant, sometimes not all that eager, to affirm the equal rights of the cognitively disabled. The history of eugenics tells that story. And yet, here we had people from the Eastern faiths, like the uh, Confucian, Dr. Chang, uh, from India, in the Hindu tradition, like Miss Mehta, from the Middle East, the Greek Orthodox Christian Charles Malik, so many others 
coming together across those historic lines of cultural and religious difference to affirm the basic dignity of the human being and basic human rights. That bill is an achievement. That's something worth celebrating. Now, look what it took to get us there. Yeah. We need to understand the UN Declaration of Human Rights on this 70th anniversary. And whenever we think about it and talk about it and try to give effect to it, we need to remember it in its historical context. December 10, 1948, that's when the final ratification occurred. This is in the wake of the terrible catastrophes of the First and Second World Wars, the untold carnage, the unspeakable horror, torture, murder, the atrocities of the Nazis, the gulag under Stalin and the Soviet Union. That's what brought together people like Chang and Malik and Mehta and the French uh, Jewish jurist, Kassan, Rene Kassan, to create the Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Declaration of 1948. But thank God and thank them that they produced this great document. Now, it's not as if it's self-executing. Having a great document by itself isn't worth much. But it does give us a kind of call to arms. And it does empower institutions of civil society. I guess what today we've come to talking sort of antiseptically of as NGOs. But people who organize together to, for example, stand up for the victims of persecution in Somalia or Sudan. It has given civil society an instrument in the name of which to demand of repressive governments, offending regimes, respect for the dignity of the human person and his rights. So Bill, that's why we're right to celebrate this. We, we've got to do a lot more than celebrating if we're going to effectuate these great principles, but we're right to celebrate. Uh, I, I think, as you, as you indicated, um, many, many people, perhaps of our age, but certainly younger people, don't understand, um, don't, don't grasp deeply what the sec how the Second World War just brutalized the world and the concentration camps. And uh, in fact, Marianne Glendon, who's a, a friend of ours, and she's also, I'm proud to say, on our, my advisory board, uh, in her book, uh, she talks about how when the United Nations was founded in, in 1945, there were some references to human rights, but not spe much specificity. But it was only kind of after, as that was going on that these atrocities were becoming known. And when you add that to the killing of civilians and stuff like that, the world really agreed to, to a statement on human rights, which I don't know if we could ever achieve again. Glendon says in her book that the interval between the end of the Second World War and the final demise of the Soviet-American partnership had just enough time for the declaration to be issued. Uh, it's true uh, that, uh, well, it was passed 48-08, and the eight abstentions included some uh, co six communist countries but no, no country voted against it. And even though the, Russia, the Russians had been difficult, they did not vote against it at the end. So it was passed unanimously. It's a standard the whole world issued. If you look in the charter of the UN, we're trying to you know, uh, avoid a third world war. And I just want to read, if I just take one second to read uh, just a word or two from the preamble, because I think you know, we talk about summoning language and summoning ideas that call us to, to be greater than ourselves, just listen to a few words. This is in the preamble. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace, whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbar... And this is a an unforgettable phrase, I think, have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights and in the dignity 
and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women. Whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of the greatest importance. The General Assembly proclaims the Universal Declaration as a common standard of achievement for all peoples. So it is a beautiful, uh, I mean, I'm sure it could be written even more beautifully, but it is a powerful uh, statement. And as uh, Professor George says, it's not binding in and of itself. It is a, it's a declaration of the world horrified by World War II and the terrible treatment of human beings said no more. So I agree with you, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful document. Uh, Professor Glendon said, it's now the most common reference point for cross-cultural discussions of decent human behavior. And, and that leads me to a question I want to ask you because it's sometimes asserted that the Universal Declaration is a product uh, of or fatally flawed by being connected with the West, that it's a, it's a Western document and therefore of no relevance to anything outside the West. Well, the certainly, uh, it's certainly true that streams of uh, thought that are dominant uh, philosophically uh, in the Declaration come from Athens and Jerusalem and from the Enlightenment uh, in the West and from other Western traditions and uh, sources. But note, as I mentioned earlier, that among the architects were people from the Eastern tradition, Hindus, Confucians, others. Uh, this is a document that speaks yes from Western sources but to people beyond the West. It wasn't just Western nations that voted yes. Uh, and if it were put to a vote today, I like to think, even though there are many more nations in the world today than, uh, than there were as members of the UN uh, back then, I like to think that it would be unanimous, if only because it would be embarrassing to vote against it. And I don't see that as some sort of triumph of Western imperialism or colonialism or anything like that. It's just that the uh, world has rightly come to affirm, at least in theory, obviously not in practice, but at least in theory come to affirm the idea that human beings, simply in virtue of their humanity, have a profound inherent and equal dignity and certain basic fundamental natural or, to use the language of the Declaration, human rights. Rights, rights that are not the gifts of kings or chieftains or parliaments or congresses or presidents or governors or prime ministers, but rights people have just in virtue of their humanity. Now, the Declaration doesn't address the obvious next question on which there would not have been consensus. And that is, okay, in virtue of what is it the case that in virtue of our humanity, we have a profound inherent and equal dignity and certain basic rights. Those of us from the traditions of faith, especially those from biblical uh, traditions, uh, certainly uh, also from the Muslim tradition, from Islam, would say, well, ultimately it's God. It's God who fashions human beings with a certain nature, uh, making it the case that um, there are certain human goods. Um, human flourishing requires certain uh, conditions and practices. And it's in virtue of our God-given rights that we have dignity and, uh, and, and worth. And those, those rights are founded upon uh, God's will. But the Declaration doesn't get into that. There was not consensus on that. But it's nevertheless remarkable that there was a consensus on something pretty fundamental. And just to repeat it yet again, the idea that there are certain rights, there's dignity that people have simply in virtue of their humanity. And think, think of how, how novel an idea, an unusual an idea that is. I mean, for most of human history, most people have not supposed anything like that. Everybody wants to think they're superior or their race or culture or people like them are superior to other, other people. 
there's always some standard by which we judge these as the superiors and those as the, as the inferiors. These are worthy of ruling, those are worried, worthy only of being ruled. These are worthy of being masters, those are worthy of being slaves. Even in our own tradition, obviously, uh, we have the, our history of slavery, which people tried to defend in religious terms, including in Christian uh, terms. That's been the historical <laughs> record for the most part over, over human history, and yet, this document reflects an understanding that, nope, as a matter of fact, the strong are not superior to the weak. The brilliant are not superior to those who are less intelligent or cognitively disabled. The beautiful are not superior to those who are uh, not so pretty, <laughs> not so handsome. Um, we're equal. We're equal in our fundamental worth and dignity. Now, none of that is to deny that there are differences of strength, intelligence, beauty, and so forth. Now, obviously, they, there are those differences. And those differences are sometimes perfectly good reasons for treating people differently. You know, we, we, we don't give wheelchairs to people who don't need wheelchairs. We give wheelchairs to people who do need uh, wheelchairs. It's okay that uh, LeBron James is able to play in the NBA and they don't want me. <laughs> That's okay. It's not discrimination. It's not a violation of our fundamental and equal dignity. But if you buy into the basic idea of inherent dignity, of equal dignity, of basic rights, then you are scandalized, as I trust all of us are. You'd be scandalized by the very thought that you could, for example, kill and take organs from a severely cognitively disabled person in order to save the life of a great athlete like LeBron James who needs a liver transplant, or a great scientist, an Albert Einstein who may need a heart transplant. Why are we scandalized by that? Because we have, thank God, internalized the idea that however salient in certain domains, the difference between you know, LeBron James is and somebody who, uh, you know, uh, is in a wheelchair, or Albert Einstein is and somebody who's cognitively disabled, that in fundamental dignity there is no difference. Einstein does not have greater dignity than a Down syndrome person. LeBron James does not have greater dignity than a paraplegic person. That's really amazing when you think about it. And it's hard to stick to it. Because we frail, fallen human creatures, even if we theoretically affirm it at some level, we're always at risk of falling into believing that by virtue of some trait or another, these really are superior to those. Think of the way some people treat the unborn child. Well, the unborn child isn't far enough along in its development, so we can treat the unborn child as inferior. Some even say the newborn child, because the newborn child hasn't yet, my colleague Peter Singer at Princeton argues this, the newborn child uh, hasn't yet developed um, the, the degree of self-awareness and mental functioning, say, of an adult rabbit or dog, and therefore we can treat the newborn child as less equal, not only than, than, a, uh, than, a, than a mature human being, but than a mature rabbit or or dog, and, and there's always the temptation to think of people who are seriously disabled, especially the cognitively disabled, as somehow inferior, as people who are um, using up resources. What the eugenicists in the old days, in that very vile phrase, referred to as useless eaters. The Nazis picked up that phrase. So we have to fight against that temptation all the time. Even those who, of us who are theoretically very strongly committed to principles of human dignity and human rights, we need to fight against that temptation. We need to be able to see the fundamental worth and humanity of anybody, the homeless person under the bridge, the disabled person, the mentally disturbed person, the person whose mental illness may result in his being very offensive, maybe even involved in criminality and so forth even those who are involved in criminality, even those who are being subjected to penal uh, punishment, still they have an unerasable fundamental human dignity.
You know, um, if, if what you've said, Robbie, is uh, very powerful about why this is an important anniversary and why this document is so important, it leads kind of the second question of is it a, is it a, is it a good, are we going to be, a, is it going to carry us into the future? Uh, so talk, I want to just quote Marianne Glendon again, but the, the idea of some criticisms uh, about the document and maybe about human rights, the whole idea. Um, Glendon says again that it's paradoxical, but the success of the Human Rights Project, the more it's shown its power, the human rights idea has shown its power, the more intense the struggle to capture that power for various ends, not all of which are respectful of human dignity. And in an article she wrote uh, about Benedict's talk 10 years ago at the UN, she said that nine dilemmas were identified in Benedict's uh, speech to the UN uh, that have become even more acute as the Human Rights Project has advanced. So I just want to mention one or two and, and see what you think about them. Um, this is, uh, one, the escalating demand for new rights. What do you think? Does that undermine us so that, well? Yes, these are very good points that Professor Glendon uh, is making. Um, I think these are points that we have to especially drive home to our young people because they have grown up in a culture in which human rights concepts, human rights ideas, human rights language has, uh, these things have prestige. And so students will latch on to them. Everyone, everybody wants to be for human rights these days, right? Who wants to say, no, no, I'm against uh, human rights? But as Professor Glendon uh, points out, that creates dangers. Now, the particular one that you asked me about, Bill, if I recall. Uh, well, this, there's, there's kind of two related ones, escalating de demands for new rights as well as a selective approach to the core rights. So a kind of a confusion about what are the rights. Sure. So let me talk a little about the first one, and I think she's absolutely right about this. Um, whenever the rhetoric of any good thing becomes the dominant rhetoric, then people are going to seize upon that rhetoric to advance whatever agenda, whatever ideology they have. Even, even, a, even, a, even a great concept like the rule of law, Plato himself, Plato pointed this out. This is how far back this Plato pointed out, that the concept of the rule of law can be used where it has prestige for bad ends. The same is true with human rights. And here's where you get the rights inflation. Since our lingua franca, as it were, is the language of human rights now in ethics, especially political ethics, people will try to win ideological battles, advance their agenda no matter what the agenda is in the language of human rights. So they'll inflate claims. Whatever they desire, they'll treat it not as a desire. They won't present it as a desire, a want, a feeling, a passion, it will be a human right. So if I want something, I have a right to it, just in virtue of my wanting it. Now, obviously, that devalues the currency, as all inflation does. That's what inflation does, <laughs> devalues currency, right? So it devalues the currency of human rights if we all dress up whatever our wishes are, whatever our agenda is, in the language of human rights. And it also has the effect, and this is her second point, of um, causing us to lose our grip on the core, fundamental, basic human rights. It treats the putative right to this or that thing, whatever we want, as equal to, let's say, the fundamental right to life, understood as the fundamental right not to uh, uh, be killed, where your, your, your death is the precise object of someone's choice or, or act. Um, uh, or the fundamental right to the free exercise of religion, the right to conscience, or the fundamental right to speak one's mind in pursuit of the, the truth. We lose our sense of the power and importance of the fundamental rights because of the inflation that happens when you identify whatever it is you desire, whatever it is on your agenda with, with rights. I have the right to my lifestyle, whatever my lifestyle is. And you try to critique the lifestyle, and they say, well, you're, you're, I obviously don't believe in human rights. Uh, another uh, example that Benedict uh, mentioned in his talk and that Glendon wrote about is, for, is forgetting the relationship 
between rights and responsibilities. Now, I, I think we can, we can uh, all, uh, con or concede or whatever, the Universal Declaration is not a perfect document. I was talking to uh, Kevin White and Brad Lewis today, and you know, it's not, it's, it's not a perfect document. None of us, if we were going to be given a, a, a grade in graduate school, you know, would it, it, would it, it would be precisely what we would write because it's an outcome of, of horse trading, but in a context of a commitment to these fundamental rights, as Robbie said. But so there's not a lot in the document about responsibilities. In fact, there's there's really only one provision, and it and it says that people uh, should remember they have rights and responsibilities. It doesn't really go into it. So. Well, it says something a little more than that. What it says, I think, is actually important. A lot more could be said. It's Article 29, right, Bill? Yeah. So Article 29 says, everyone has duties to the community, but then it says, by reference here to the community, everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. So we are persons in communities. All of us are. We're born into the community of the family. You don't come out of nowhere. You don't give birth to yourself, as my friend Cornel West <laughs> reminds us. You know, we don't, if, if, that, if, you're, if you're such a radical individualist that you can't account for how you came into this world, you think you gave birth to yourself, you gotta, you gotta fix up your philosophy a little bit. You come in, it's social relations. It's the, it's the union of a man and a woman to begin with that brings you uh, into existence as a member of a family. As, as my friend Michael Sandel points out, Tom Hibbs and I recently did for Baylor a nice program with Professor Sandel here in Washington, D.C. As Professor Sandel points out, we come into the world not as tabula rasa, not as unencumbered selves, but already as members of families and kinship groups and religious communities. We come with an identity already. Now it's not the whole story. We can change some of those things. We can change our religion and so forth. We can leave our family. Sometimes there are reasons, that good reasons for people to, to detach themselves from families. I hope that doesn't happen too often because the family is so important to the flourishing of the human being. But what the Declaration does acknowledge in Article 29 is people need communities. The flourishing of people is not a matter of rights alone. Certainly not a matter of negative rights alone. Or even negative rights and positive rights, and we can talk about the differences and so forth in a, in a bit. There are also things independent of rights that matter to the flourishing of human beings, including very fundamentally duties that we all have to each other. Now, some of those duties are specific to the smaller communities of which we're members are duties within the family, uh, parents' duties to children, eventually, as some of us who are my age um, uh, come to realize, duties of children to parents, du du duties of siblings to each other. We have duties as members of religious communities, our, our religious duties. We have uh, duties in uh, relation to others with whom we, we work. Uh, we have all sorts of communities that we're members of, and we have all sorts of duties in relation to those. And those duties, like those rights, are themselves implications of the good of human beings, the multifaceted, very variegated good of the human person as a, as a creature that is biological, physical, that is intellectual, rational, that has feelings and emotions, that enters into social relations with each other, that wonders about the meaning of it all and aspires to some sort of relationship with the more than merely human sources of meaning and value. We are complex critters. The good of the human being is variegated, and the good of the human being requires a recognition of duties as well as rights. Would you want to say a word about the negative and positive rights? In the uh, yeah, uh, we Americans uh, tend, not, I, I, I want to use a weak word there, tend, uh, when we think of rights to think of negative uh, rights. Maybe it's our rugged individualism, which I don't hold in contempt at all. I mean, I think there's some truth in the idea of, of uh, rugged individualism. It's something we should affirm, but not to the detriment of a recognition of our 
uh, community uh, responsibilities and of, the, of, of our needs as human persons to flourish in communities. But when we Americans think of rights, we tend to think of negative rights. That is, rights that other people or rights that government not do this or that to us, not interfere with our free exercise of religion, not interfere with our right to speak our minds, not interfere with our right to publish um, investigations of the government, uh, publish in the media. Uh, our rights to assemble together, to have a meeting like this, or to have a political rally, or to have a, uh, a protest, and, uh, and so forth. But um, the Europeans, and of course there was large European participation in the Declaration, um, when they think of rights, think not only of the negative rights, but also of positive rights, the rights that the community, or at least communities, have to individuals, or the obligations that community or communities have to individuals which are the um, uh, correlatives of the rights people have. The right to education. Uh, the right is in this document to social security. Now that doesn't mean necessarily the system we call social security, but to something to ensure that people in their old age uh, don't fall into uh, complete uh, poverty. Uh, the right to health care. Um, these positive rights uh, can be spoken of meaningfully. Uh, I think in many cases they could be affirmed. I would want to affirm them. But it's very important to note the differences in theory and practice between negative rights and positive rights. Uh, when, especially when speaking of positive rights, it's very important to consider what exactly is being asserted. If someone says I have a right to health care or everybody has a right to health care, the question that's got to be asked is, okay, yes, uh, we want a society in which, to the extent humanly possible, feasible, uh, uh, people are not rendered destitute by health emergencies and people have access to health care. But who is supposed to provide health care to whom? On what terms? Why should this be the provider rather than that be the provider? Should it be the government in a socialized system, or should it be the market, or should it be some mix of government and market? To simply assert a right to health care or any posi other positive right, a right to education, what have you, is not to say very much yet. That's different from negative rights. To say that I have the right to the free exercise of religion pretty clearly means, pretty straightforwardly, neither the government nor any powerful group within society or any other individual can stop me from going to Mass or require me to go to Mass or stop me from holding a Passover Seder, or for celebrating uh, uh, the uh, holy month of Ramadan. We get that. We understand that. It's pretty straightforward. Now, we may have a debate about whether there is such a right or what the scope and limits of the right are. We have a very good debate uh, going right now about the scope and uh, limits of the right to religious freedom. But things get a lot more complicated because they're less clear when it comes to positive rights like education and Healthcare. The goal is one on which people can agree. We want to make healthcare affordable and accessible for everyone. But there's also a very legitimate debate about whether that should be a socialized system in which the government provides or a market system that ensures a lower cost and therefore greater affordability and accessibility or some mix. To just say I have a right to healthcare doesn't really say much of anything. And too often, an assertion of a positive right is just a kind of um, rhetorical device meant to claim without saying so that you think the government should provide this or that or the other thing. Well, if the government should provide it, we're going to need an argument for why it should be the government. And we're going to have to consider what the pros and cons are of a socialized system. And that can be a complicated business. One on which, by the way, to finish the thought, yeah. one on which it's likely to be the case with respect to these positive rights that reasonable societies differ in how they think the good ought to be provided. Differ in light of their history, their traditions, their uh, cultures, the people's own sense of priorities. If I assert there's a right to health care, well, where should health care be in a list of social priorities? Where should it be in relation to education? Where should it be in relation to 
recreation. Any community's got to make decisions like that, even if you've decided to provide some good on a social basis. The, the, the town of Bethesda, Maryland, will have to make a decision with its limited resources. Do we think what we need now is a new swimming pool for our kids or a library? Even a rich place like Bethesda sometimes can't afford both. So it's got to prioritize. It's got to make decisions. And the assertion of a right to recreation or a right to um, education is not going to solve anything. That's just, that's just rhetoric. Now again, I'll, I'll close just by, on, on this point just by saying none of this is meant to say that to claim positive rights is a meaningless thing, much less to claim that we should never make assertions of positive rights. It's just to note that if you make claims of positive rights, then you've got some arguing, you've got some uh, intellectual work that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to provide the explanation for how you think the good that people have a right to should be provided and why it's that way. Yeah, and I would even say that that thought is echoed in that Article 22, which talks about economic, cultural, and social rights, but it says the obligation uh, of the states to provide these depends on the organization and resources of each state. That's so right. it's a, just like you're saying, Bethesda has to figure out how to, how to do these things. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, well, uh, one of the, uh, I want to ask you about religious liberty, but first I just want to say that one of the points that uh, Glendon and, and Benedict the Sixteenth had noted was one of the problem, uh, not necessarily problems, but b becoming more acute that we have to think about is the question of foundation of the document. And again, I was talking to Brad Lewis today and he was reminding me that Maritan had said, we agree, we came to agreement on this uh, list or catalog, but not on the underlying theory, because like you said, it's from different cultural perspectives. But we need, it seems to me, to have a discussion about the foundations behind these so that we can solidify a commitment to them and not have things start to split apart, because one of the dangers here is this is just seen as a catalog, you know, one through 30. And so Country A says, well, I'm going to do number four, but I'm not going to do number 26 or whatever. So there's a kind of a unity here. And from Catholic social teaching, there's a kind of a unity here. But we have to keep discussing that. But I think what Robbie is saying is showing that there's quite, the document itself gives us an opportunity to have these discussions. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, Maritan was simply reporting a fact. Um, uh, Malik. Uh, for example, Charles Malik, the great Lebanese uh, statesman, Greek Orthodox, uh, and uh, Mr. Chang, uh, coming from the Confucian uh, tradition, uh, Chinese, uh, during the deliberations had some lively debates about the, about the fundamentals. Uh, and they never reached an agreement. And they decided that they couldn't reach uh, an agreement uh, on the theory. What's the correct theory, if there is a correct theory? But they nevertheless were entirely united on the basic idea that people have rights just in virtue of their humanity. They have dignity in virtue of their humanity. Their dignity is an equal dignity, a profound and equal dignity, and there are rights that flow from that. Now, there's a lesson in that for us. What happened between Chang and, and, and Malik really is a kind of uh, uh, emblem of, I think, what goes on more broadly. The different traditions of faith and other, comp what, to use John Rawls's uh, term, comprehensive views, be they religious or secular in the world, uh, need not agree on the theory. Um, they certainly need not reach perfect agreement on the theory. But all of us as individual persons who are wondering whether we buy the idea of human dignity, whether we buy the idea of human rights, need to ask ourselves, why should we? And if we do buy it, if we do support the Declaration, why do we? Now, we'll need our own theory. That's not to say that people with a different theory can't also affirm the same basic list of rights or the principle of inherent and equal dignity. But in each of our cases, we have to ask whether we think there are sufficient grounds for it. There are obviously alternative views to the human rights view. One grand theory that's an alternative to it is the theory known as utilitarianism, which really kind of takes 
rights uh, out of the picture, although one great utilitarian, the famous John Stuart Mill, thought he could square the, uh, square the circle. But most serious utilitarians think that, that the idea of rights really isn't a good uh, piece of moral currency, that, uh, that the way you resolve any problem of morality, including political morality, is to choose the option among morally significant options, choose the option that overall and in the long run promises to produce the net best proportion of benefit to harm, however you define benefit of har or harm, and the idea of righteous doesn't uh, figure in that. Or there's, the, of course, the rule utilitarian version, act on the rule that the acting on which overall and in the long run promises to produce the net best proportion of benefit to harm, however you define benefit and uh, harm. But if we're going to reject those alternative approaches and embrace a human rights approach, we need to know what the good reason is. So we need to be wrestling with it, even if we acknowledge that there, are, there is more than one. In fact, there are many uh, traditions uh, of faith and other comprehensive views uh, that can uh, ground a basic human rights view. You know, I'm just going to ask one more question, then we'll open it up for your questions. Um, and I want to ask just about one particular article, just your thoughts on it, whether you think it does a good job of capturing the essence, uh, and that's on, on freedom of religion. It's, it's Article 18. I'll just read it for those of you who, who don't have it in front of you. Uh, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. So one question is, uh, does that, is it, sound to have thought and conscience along with religion, uh, or does it weaken the uh, commitment to religious freedom? But anyway, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others in public or in private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. What do you think about that? It's a very important article. Uh, I, I myself have no problem with the language of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. I, I recognize the argument. I've heard it before that Bill uh, has put on the table uh, here. I'm not saying Bill endorsed it, just put it on the table, that uh, it should speak only of freedom of religion because to speak of freedom of thought and conscience as well as religion somehow dilutes the, the um, protections for uh, religion as a special uh, category. Um, I hear... Um, follow some of the work of my late uh, beloved friend, uh, Professor Jean Bethke Elstein of the University of, of Chicago, uh, who uh, taught about the importance of conscience and the need to not distinguish too sharply between conscience and religion. Much of what we are talking about when we're talking about religious freedom is the freedom of conscience in respect of the matters of religion, in respect of the great questions that different traditions of religious faith address. Where did we come from? How did this reality that we experience happen? Uh, do we have an end, an ultimate end to which we're headed? Uh, where, where did we come from? Where are we going? Um, what is the source or what are the sources of meaning and value? Is there a more than merely human source or are there more than merely human sources of meaning and value? What is the meaning of life? Uh, is there a higher law, a law that uh, calls us beyond our self-interest, beyond our personal autonomy, uh, beyond our trying to get whatever we want? to, for example, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Those are great existential questions that every human being needs to wrestle with. Part of our flourishing consists in wrestling with those questions. We're, we're diminished as humans if we do not wrestle with those questions. And religions propose answers to those questions. And they are themselves arguments and traditions of argumentation about those questions. So if we're to honor human flourishing, if we're to honor the dignity of the human being, we need to recognize the right of each and every human being to raise those questions, to seek honestly to answer them as best he or she can 
without wishful thinking or, or answering them in a way that is especially convenient for some other interest that they have or some, some, some goal they want to achieve, to raise those questions, answer them honestly, and then to live a life of authenticity and integrity in line with one's best judgments, whatever they are, about the answers to those questions. Is there a God? Has God spoken to men through revelation? Is there a higher law? Is there a law of God, an eternal law? Is there a natural law that is over and above, as Martin Luther King taught, the positive law, and in light of which the positive law, as King says in the letter from Birmingham jail, jail can be judged just or unjust? To, to flourish as human beings, we need to be able to ask and answer those questions and to live with integrity, whether our answers are theistic or non-theistic, whether they lead us to the Catholic faith or they lead us to a Protestant position or to Islam or to this or that tradition within Islam, or whether, like Camus, they lead us to unbelief. Still, there's value, as the Catholic Church recognizes, actually, in the document Dignitatis Humanae. Uh, of the Second Vatican Council. There's value even for the unbeliever in living a life of authenticity and integrity in line with his best judgments. Now, of course, from a Catholic point of view, if your judgment is unbelief, the, you, the Catholic believes, the church believes you've made a wrong judgment. The judgment's wrong. But still, there's value in living with authenticity and integrity in light of one's best judgment, and it would be an offense against human dignity to force a Camus, a Camus uh, to act as if he believed what, in fact, he doesn't believe, to act as if he believed in God, if he doesn't believe in God. And I think that's an important point for us to write. You don't need to be a Catholic to see the truth in, 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 in that point. So these matters of conscience we uh, uh, wrestle with and that need to be uh, protected in a very fundamental way relate to those great questions, which I think can rightly be called religious questions, mm -hmm. the questions of meaning and, and value, the source of it all, where it's all going, whether there is a higher law. So I, I think I'll open it up. Uh, well, before you do, Bill, can uh, I just, I just yeah. want to lay uh, some emphasis on, um, on an additional point that you called our attention to in Article 18. This is something uh, that um, uh, I think we need to remind our fellow citizens of frequently. The right to religious freedom is not simply a right to private worship. It's, it's more than merely a right to say a prayer around the dinner table or to get on your knees before bedtime or go to the church or synagogue or mosque or temple on the appropriate uh, day of worship. It's much more than that. It's the right to give witness to one's faith, whatever one's faith is, in public as well as private, in community as well as individually. The Declaration couldn't be clearer about this, and the Declaration is absolutely right about that. And we need to remind people who claim that they support the Declaration on Human Rights of this when we hear them talking in such a way as to narrow religious freedom to the private sphere, reduce it to mere freedom of worship. Oh, no. It's the freedom to, to act together in community as well as individually, publicly as well as privately, and the right to bring one's religiously inspired convictions about justice and human rights into the public square to vie for the allegiance of our fellow citizens on terms of equality with everybody else. This is what Martin Luther King did. He's our example. He's our modern exemplar in this. He brought his biblically inspired vision of justice and the common good to the public square to compete with those who held a different view, to try to persuade his fellow citizens that the right path was the, pro was the path of racial harmony and racial justice. Okay, you can That's now. not an essential point. That's an essential point. So do we have questions? Yeah, go ahead. I think there's a microphone so that it'll go onto the live stream. Just the 
conflation of desires with rights and how this devalues um, the fundamental rights. And so my question is, uh, what do you think is the most dangerous or prevalent uh, desire that's misconstrued as a human right in our society today and why? Thank you. Well, I don't know if there's any one that we could uh, hold out. There's a kind of idolatry of, of um, desire um, in our uh, society and in our, our, in our Western societies more generally. Um, too many people have come to give up on the power of reason itself, uh, informed by faith or not, but the power of reason uh, to judge between desires or among desires, uh, to identify the good that we should desire because it's good, as opposed to whatever it is we simply desire. Philosophically, this is the reduction of what Aristotle called practical reason to a purely instrumental role. Uh, the first straightforward articulation of this in philosophy, in, in modern philosophy, or in philosophy generally that I know of, came from Hobbes in Leviathan. So we're going all the way back several centuries. Hobbes said, the thoughts are to the desires as scouts and spies to range abroad and find the way to the thing desired. This is the purely instrumental view of practical reason. Reason can't tell us what we ought to want. It can only tell us how to get what we want whatever it is we want. So if there are any rights, the rights are going to have to be identified with the wants because there are no true goods considered as something independent of what we happen to want that the rights could be protectors of. See, on the, on the, on the Catholic theory, the, the, the theory that will be front and center in the, in, the, um, in the tradition of human rights reflection that the master's program that Bill's going to be uh, directing run. In that theory, what are rights? Rights protect human goods. Rights are correlative to duties that we have in virtue of the goods, the flourishing of human beings, the goods that constitute the flourishing of human beings. But if we have a purely instrumental view of practical reason, then it's wants and not goods that are ultimately calling the tune. Uh, David Hume really was Hobbes' successor when Hume said, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and may pretend to no office other than to serve and obey them. Again, reason is the ingenious servant who can find the way to get what we desire, the passions, but it can't actually tell us what we should be passionate about, what we should want. So people with a Hobbesian, Humean understanding, whether they've ever read or even heard of these philosophers, if they have an understanding that's shaped by this ideology, then there's an idolatry of want. And the, the, the language we use in our idolatries today is the language of the day. It's human rights language. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, my great friend, the great uh, former chief rabbi of the, the United Kingdom, uh, says that you can be guaranteed that, um, that, what, that anti-Semitism will always be present and it will always be defended in whatever the dominant language of discourse is. So sure enough, today, anti-Semitism is defended in the discourse of, of, of human rights. So today, whatever desires people have, whether it's for money, sexual license, fame, attention, whatever it is people really want, it will be dressed up in the language of human rights. So you'll get kind of radical forms of libertarianism. Now, this is not to reject libertarian ideology or philosophy wholesale. I think there's, I think there's a good deal of truth in, in the best writing among our libertarian friends, and I've learned a lot from them. Uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is the idea that uh, in a circumstance of rights idolatry, if money's the thing you want, you embrace a kind of libertarianism of the market. If sex is the sort of thing you want, it'll be a, an expressive individualism uh, so characteristic of the me generation with its famous imbecilic slogan, if it feels good, do it. People will always dress the want up in the language of rights. That's my point.
Yep, in the last row there. Oh, Dennis, yeah, hey. Hi, thank you, uh, Robbie, for your insightful and rather succinct comments. And I, what I want to uh, question you more on is, right, we talk about uh, the, the negative and positive rights, the European understanding, and in contrast, the American tradition is more negative rights. But I wonder if that underestimates somewhat the significance of, po of positive rights in America in the progressive movement oh, and, yeah. and perhaps represented in the policies of President Obama to some extent. And that might be well and fine to add these on, but the concern is if that comes at the price of classic negative rights, such as freedom of religion and freedom of association, and have we not seen some erosion there? So my broader context for that is, is whether the threats to this core understanding of human rights rooted in human dignity are threatened not just by remnants of communism or uh, extreme radical movements such as ISIS, uh, but in the hearts of the West itself and uh, Western Europe and the United States? Well, it's a wonderful question. Um, we can go back to the New Deal. Uh, and of course, the context for the New Deal was the, the Great Depression and the extreme want and fear that people felt. Roosevelt proposes his four freedoms. Uh, uh, someone can correct me if I'm, I'm going to rely on President Garvey for this. John, if I get this one wrong, help me. I think they fundamentally boil down to freedom of speech, freedom of religion and conscience, freedom from fear, yeah. and freedom, freedom from, from want. want. Yeah. Do I, do I, yes. got this? Have I got this right? Um, yeah, uh, so it's a kind of combination there of negative rights and, and, uh, and, and positive rights. So it's deeply embedded in at least that kind of progressive strand of American and not just European, not just European thought. It's a good point and a fair one that you've uh, you've made uh, there. Um, where I think things tend to go wrong is when we conceive of political theory or social theory more generally as having essentially two players: the state and the individual. And then the whole game is to design the proper relationship of the state to the individual. What this leaves out of the picture are Burke's little platoons, the institutions of civil society that carry the lion's share of the burden of providing health education and, and welfare, and which can be enervated, undermined, displaced, when the state moves in too aggressively and begins to take over those roles, undermining the authority and integrity and autonomy of the family, the religious uh, community, the mutual aid uh, uh, society. Um, and, and that happens both on the left and on the right. Uh, much libertarian thought does tend to see the contest as between the state and the individual and want to put the thumb heavily on the scales in favor of the individual. And it happens on the left, where the socialist impulse causes the same sort of thing, but in the opposite direction. So you see the state and the individual as the players, and the thumb is put heavily on the side of the state to provide positive assistance of various sorts to the individual. We'll only get this right and the state will remain within its proper sphere if we protect the autonomy and the integrity and recognize the just authority of the institutions of civil society. If they're not pushed off the stage, you know, out of the, uh, out of the, uh, out of the picture. Um, the, the, I love what, so much about the Declaration, but one of the things is it's, um, its uh, recognition of this, especially when it comes to the family. So here's a whole declaration on uh, rights, but it is careful right smack in 16. the heart of the thing. So 16 of 30 articles, number 16, right smack in the heart of the thing. My Straussian friends will take note that it's in the center <laughs> of things. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. In other words, it's not the role of the state to undermine the family or interfere with its just autonomy and its just authority. Quite to the contrary, it is the obligation of, of the state to favor and to foster and support and to defend, if necessary, 
the institution of the family. We might say the same thing about the church and the neighborhood uh, community and the Campfire Girls and the 4-H and all of Blur Burke's uh, little platoons, all of the institutions of civil society, all of the institutions that Tocqueville noticed as far back as the 1830s were essential to the functioning and success of American democracy, of democracy in America. That's, I think, what gets forgotten at the two extremes, at the libertarian and socialist extremes, the importance, the centrality of the institutions of civil society. And that's relevant to rights. If we're going to talk about what positive rights people have, people have a right to be brought up in the family to the extent possible. Now, bad things happen. You know, parents are killed. Parents leave the family. There are bad things that happen, and we have to do something about that. But it's still sensible to say, it's meaningful to say, that a child has a right to be brought up with his mother and his father. There's a right to be brought up in the family. And, and, and a communist state that comes in and, and, and commandeers the kids, takes the kids away from the family, or interferes with the family relation so that the parents cannot be proper, and it doesn't matter whether it's communist or what it is, but any state that does that is violating the rights of the child, violating the rights of the parents, violating the rights of the families. All of that can be put into the language of rights, too. Yeah, your former student there. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious about what you think about thinkers like Alistair McIntyre or Stanley Hauerwas, who um, are wary of using rights language, um, but nonetheless uh, wish to uphold the dignity of the human person, um, unlike, say, the utilitarians. Um, do you think such an approach is acceptable, or um, do you think there needs to be an explicit appeal uh, to rights? Uh, I'm not surprised to be getting such an intelligent and well-informed question from my former student, Ellie Brown, who I'm very <laughs> proud of, uh, who was graduated from Princeton last year, summa cum laude of Phi Beta Kappa, and with a truckload of other awards and uh, honors. And it is a very good question, uh, Ellie, and I am very proud of you, and I'm glad that you're here at the Dominican House of Studies. Um, uh, there's a reason that people like McIntyre and Howard Wass uh, and someone with whom I've debated the question, Joan Lockwood O'Donovan, the British uh, uh, political uh, philosopher, um, there's a reason that they're um, wary of the language of rights. Uh, legitimate worry. They're worried that it uh, builds in a kind of individualism. It builds in the liberalism of the atomistic individual sort, the, the, the kind of liberalism that celebrates the atomistic individual. I don't want any part of that either. And I can see the concern that if we get so focused on rights that we forget about responsibilities, if we get so focused on rights that we treat rights as fundamental realities as opposed to being uh, uh, principles that protect human goods, that are correlative to duties that we have in virtue of the good of the human person, the flourishing, the welfare of the human person. I get it that we need to worry about that. But I think that we can um, articulate rights claims in a way, even for the general public, we can articulate it in a way that makes it clear that we're not buying into any kind of radical individualism or radical autonomy view or atomism or anything of the kind much less selfishness or anything uh, like that. Now, that, I think, imposes a responsibility on people like me and Brother Saunders, who uh, do want to do business, in part, in the language of rights. We have a duty to make clear, to find a way to articulate our views in a way that makes clear that we reject that atomism. We reject that, that kind of liberalism. We reject that kind of individualism, absolutely, for sure. But I think we can do it, and I think if you look at our work, you know, we, we have done it. Um, now, having said all that, I do think we need to acknowledge, candidly, that because rights are not foundational moral principles, values, human goods, duties are more fundamental, it's possible to articulate I'll just be very, very overly cautious out of an abundance of caution, as we lawyers say, uh, and say almost always. We can almost always articulate the point, the claim, the principle of justice that we're interested in 
without using the language of rights. So anything that I defend in the language of rights, or just about everything I defend in the language of rights, I could defend in a moral language without any reference to rights, just in terms of principles of justice, obligations people have, and so forth. But I do think that the language of rights is supple and useful in calling attention to the beneficiaries of the duties that we have in justice to those to whom we owe duties, the beneficiaries of the duties that we owe to others. And it helps us to remember that it's their fundamental worth and dignity as human beings that is the ground of our obligation, that is the correlative of their right. One final point, Ellie, since you put this on the table, and I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, the final point is uh, rights is not a univocal concept. Uh, there are different kinds of rights, not only different categories of rights, but literally different kinds of rights. Uh, those of you who are law professors, President Garvey is one, Bill is another. Uh, those of you uh, who are law professors, and perhaps those of you who are lawyers who will think back to law school, probably will remember studying uh, Wesley Hofeld's um, theory of rights. Uh, and Hofeld, who was professor at Yale uh, Law School in the 1920s and 30s, I believe, um, uh, Hofeld uh, noticed that the term rights is used sometimes to mean liberties, sometimes to mean powers, sometimes to mean immunities, sometimes to mean what he called claim rights. And those really are different kinds of things. A claim right corresponds to the absence of a duty. The absence of a duty uh, is correlative to a liberty. I, I'm, if I don't have a duty to do something or not do it, I'm at liberty as to whether to do it or, or not do it. And if I'm at liberty whether to do it or not do it, that means that nobody has a claim right against me that I do it or, or not do it. So some precision, analytic precision, of the sort that Hofeld helped us to bring, I think is important so that we just don't run everything together, liberties and claim rights and powers and immunities. Those, those who have taken up the burden of doing the intellectual work in defense of rights need to be attentive to those kinds of distinctions. Uh, just one second. Stephen Higgins, where are you? Do we have time for more questions? Yeah, okay. Let's keep going. Yeah. First row there. Yeah, you. Didn't, yeah. A related question. So it seems that one way of thinking about rights is as default rules or presumptions that could be overridden by heightened justification. So the right to free speech, say, becomes the right to force the state to justify an infringement of the right by showing that it's narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest. It seems then that oftentimes with rights, we're just simply engaging in a form of moral reasoning. And so my question then is, is the point of the declaration, the point that you just made, that in naming what these rights are, it simply draws special attention to them in engaging in moral reasoning and saying, this is something that we shouldn't forget. Because otherwise, it seems like the rights are still subject to the sort of overriding moral justifications that the Nazis themselves would have made. Uh, well, in response to that, I would uh, say that uh, there are different categories of rights. Uh, some rights are absolute. Uh, the right of an innocent person not to be made the direct object of an act intending his death, the, the, the fully specified idea of the right to life, that is an absolute. That can't be overridden by social utility considerations or anything like that, at least in, at least in my view. Now, utilitarians have a different view, right? I mean, if, the, if you anticipate bad enough consequences, they'll say, well, that will justify even the killing of an innocent man. But if, if you buy into the utilitarian story, you're out of the human rights again, fundamentally. And certainly the, that utilitarian approach would be utterly incompatible with a Catholic or natural law uh, approach. So I'm happy to have the debate with the utilitarians, but within my uh, tradition, within my view of these things, some rights are absolute. Another is the right not to be tortured. Another is the right not to be forced to practice a religion one does not believe in. I don't think those can be overridden for any considerations. Then there are other rights that are not absolute and we have to specify them, and then we can start thinking about what their uh, limits uh, uh, are. The right to the free exercise of religion does not the, include the right to torture other people in the name of religion. Even if your conscience requires you, even if your conscience requires you to fly a plane into buildings, uh, 
or to, or to burn heretics. It's a violation of other people's rights, and it can't be accepted as part of, within the scope of, the free exercise of religion. Same with freedom of speech. Not all aspects of the right to freedom of speech are absolute. There are limits. Uh, we don't have the right to defame each other. One another interesting thing about the Declaration, while it uh, does um, articulate the right to free speech, just as our Constitution does in the First Amendment to the Bill of, uh, the, the, in the First Amendment in our Bill of Rights, um, unlike our Bill of Rights, the Declaration goes to the um, bother to point out that in addition to the right to free speech, people have a right to their reputations and that the state has an obligation to provide some provision to protect, presumably slander and libel laws, to protect people's re reputations or allow them to protect their own uh, reputations. I, I don't know how that principle uh, uh, could be applied uh, against, say, New York Times against uh, Sullivan. Uh, to go to an old Warren Court case from uh, 1965, which very significantly reduced uh, the, the, the reputational rights uh, of people who count as public, uh, public figures. Um, so I think that's a very important distinction between absolute and non-absolute. Now, even when we're in the domain of non-absolute rights, I would not want to accept something like my late teacher Ronald Dworkin's view of rights as trumps against general utility, where we conceive of what he called matters of policy in utilitarian terms to be trumped by what he called matters of principle expressed in the language of rights. I think it's a mistake to import utilitarianism into any of the picture when it comes to theories of political morality, to political theory. So I would uh, urge a concept of the common good which understood the common good in non-utilitarian terms and which understood that rights, far from being trumps on the pursuit of the common good, are themselves aspects, irreducible aspects, of the common good of any decent society. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Right. That's fine. <laughs> we'll get the next. We'll get okay. get you next. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> a question that came to mind, and and as you were uh, in your previous answer talking about uh, sort of compelled religion, uh, concern that often comes up or is represented about Islam, uh, particularly say in yeah. ISIS, where there's violence against non-believers. Uh, a question that came to mind was, as you were talking about the background of the declaration, were there uh, Islamic scholars or thinkers that were involved in the, in the declaration? You referred to Confucian and other traditions, but I didn't hear Islam and wanted to know if there were Islamic it, thinkers. The, the declaration were was ratified uh, by uh, Islamic countries. Um, uh, many Islamic countries today, including some that uh, were not in the UN uh, at the time, uh, uh, uphold, well, they, they purport at least to uphold, you know, the, a lot of regimes claim to uphold the principles of the Declaration or claim to support it, but don't actually practice what they, uh, what they, what they preach. But um, there is a provision, Bill quoted it, um, in Article 16, the Free Exercise of Religion article, uh, that says that people's right to religious freedom includes the right to leave your religion. And this is a hotly disputed issue in many Muslim societies and among Muslim scholars. There are reputable Muslim scholars who believe, as I believe, that the right to religious freedom does include, at least against the civil authority, mm -hmm. a right to leave your religion. In other words, gives you, to use the Hofeldian term, an immunity. That's the right. It's a right in the sense of an immunity from civil coercion against leaving your religion. Now, these same scholars, as faithful Muslims would say, that does not mean that you have a right against God to leave your religion, or a general abstract right to leave your religion, because you have a duty to remain faithful to Islam. You are not at liberty, to use the Hofeldian category, to leave your religion. So you have a claim right against the government, the civil authority, 
to leave your religion, but not a liberty against God or a general moral right to leave your religion. Now, there are other reputable Muslim scholars uh, who do not interpret uh, the, um, uh, the, the data of Islamic faith to permit leaving your religion uh, as a right even against the civil authority. Um, I have a view about which side I hope wins that struggle, <laughs> but I have no right as a non-Muslim to say what the true Islam is. Um, but I'm certainly uh, supportive of the efforts, sometimes heroic efforts, of uh, wonderful Muslims uh, to um, uh, uphold a robust conception of, of religious freedom. Uh, even some who will not go as far as to recognize a right of um, people against the civil authority to leave a religion will still um, defend a fairly robust uh, conception of free exercise of religion that would forbid, for example, coercing non-Muslims. There was a wonderful declaration just uh, three or four years ago uh, organized by uh, Sheikh bin Baya, Sheikh Hamza, Musl yeah. uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, um, uh, Hamza Yusuf, and others uh, called the Marrakesh, Marrakesh the Marrakesh Declaration on, on the rights of non-Muslims in Muslim-majority societies and states. And I welcome and I applaud that. I think it's terrific what they did. Now, of course, not everybody in the Islamic world was happy about that. And they did this at some risk to themselves because there are extremists like ISIS and al-Shabaab and, and uh, al-Qaeda and others uh, who would target people responsible for that kind of thing as, um, as infidels, as enemies. Uh, of the faith. So uh, all praise to them for doing it, even though some of them would not have gone as far as to recognize the right of a Muslim to leave Islam. We also, I think, need to recognize uh, that uh, Muslims are sometimes among the victims of religious persecution. Sometimes that's within Muslim societies where minority Muslim groups um, like the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslims in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia are persecuted by the majority. Muslim sex. Other times, as in Myanmar, it's Muslims being persecuted by non-Muslims. Uh, in Myanmar, it's Buddhist persecution of, um, of, of Muslims. Uh, so uh, the situation in Islam is complicated. Islam is a variegated faith. There are many different types of Islam. There are many different cultures um, that, uh, uh, in which uh, Islam is a central uh, part. Another thing that we need to be cognizant of, and, and too often we're not, in the West, and we'd help if the media would learn a bit about Islam. We need to be cognizant of the differences between cultural practices that are associated with a religion but not required by the religion and requirements of the religion. Um, female genital mutilation is not required in Islamic faith, but there are Muslim cultures and some non-Muslim cultures in which it is practiced. Now, the circumcision of male infants is required by the Jewish faith. And now we have a, um, a movement, uh, I'll lay my cards on the table, to which I am uh, very strongly opposed to try to forbid male infant circumcision on the ground that it's a violation of the rights of the, of the child. If, if, if that prevails in, in, in the European countries where it has become very prominent, there's even a strong developing movement called intactivism uh, in the United States against um, uh, male infant circumcision because male infant circumcision is required in the Jewish faith and is not optional. You can't, even, you can't even not circumcise your infant son if the law forbids it. There's some things in the Jewish faith that are ordinarily required but if, if you're forbidden by the civil law from doing it, you, you, can, you can respect the civil law. This is not one of them. My beloved former student, Mayor Soloveitchik, Rabbi Soloveitchik, uh, tells me this is something that Jews would actually have to leave countries if it were forbidden, if male infant service, it would cause Jews to have to leave countries if male infant circumcision were, uh, were uh, forbidden. This, by the way, is an example uh, of uh, that point I was um, referring to earlier that Michael Sandel uh, makes. The intactivist movement, which would forbid Jews and Muslims uh, from practicing male infant circumcision, um, conceives the child as a tabula rasa, 
as an unencumbered self. It comes into the world as just a potential autonomous chooser. The role of the parents is to feed the baby, uh, diaper the baby, educate the baby until it's 18 years old, and then it can decide whether to be circumcised or not. I, I don't think there'd be much business for the Moel uh, in, in, that, in that case. Um, but of course, from the Jewish point of view, uh, that is not an unencumbered self. That, you know, a, a secularist, liberal, or progressive might look at the baby and say, you know what that is, that's a baby, that's an unencumbered self, that, that, that's a future chooser, just not in a position to choose now. But the Orthodox Jewish family, the observant, the devout Jewish family looks at the baby and says, that's a Jewish baby. And because that's a Jewish baby, we're required in fidelity to the ancient covenant to circumcise the child, bring the child within the covenant. It's, these are fundamentally different worldviews. It's really a profound uh, difference. Don, Don, you want to come in on this? Uh, of course, you know something about this. Since you mentioned intactivism, it interested me because I have Jewish relatives. Oh, Don sorry. Eden Goldstein. Uh, thank you. Yes, Don Eden Gold Goldstein, uh, Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Um, since you mentioned intactivism, uh, that interested me because I have cousins uh, who I believe would be sympathetic to the idea that children should be autonomous uh, choosers of uh, their sex or gender. And these cousins of, of mine are Reformed Jews. So just for my dialogue with these cousins, I was interested in whether, um, in, in whether you see a larger cultural force that is motivating both intactivism and this, uh, I, this idea uh, that, um, that children should not be designated a sex at birth. Uh, Dawn, I suppose there probably is, I haven't thought it through, but okay. I suppose there probably is a connection here between the idea of um, the person as a radically autonomous chooser who begins as a tabula rasa, an unencumbered self, and the idea of uh, radical plasticity, that we can manufacture our own uh, identities, uh, or can we, we can discover some, some self, some psyche, or some spirit that is uh, radically independent of our bodies, that's our true self, that inhabits and uses our body as a kind of extrinsic instrument. I, I think the view that, uh, that you're reporting your cousin's holding here uh, has at its foundation a view of human identity, a view of the human person that divides the person into a biological reality and a psychic or spiritual uh, reality. It's a, it's a, this person-body dualism is as old as the Gnostic uh, heresy, or even going back uh, further, actually. And um, if, if you buy into that, you might uh, uh, be tempted to, well, what you would be believing is that we human beings are non-bodily persons, psyches, spirits, souls, inhabiting non-personal bodies. Um, and we use those non-personal bodies as instruments. And if the non-personal body doesn't line up with the psyche, we're not damaging or violating the person by performing acts on the body, hormone treatments, amputations, whatever, to bring the body more into line, according to what criteria I'm not quite sure, but more into line with the psyche. Um, that kind of dualism has been rejected by Christianity, I believe, by the mainstream of Judaism. Yes. Uh, I, I think the Gnostics were rejected by Christians and Jews uh, alike in favor of a view uh, that um, uh, Aristotelians label hylomorphism, which sees the person not as a ghost in a machine, or a psyche inhabiting a body, but as a dynamic unity of body, mind, and spirit. So that the body, far from being a, a vehicle of the person or a non-personal or sub-personal instrument, is part of the personal reality of the human being, every bit as much as the, as the mind or the psyche or the soul is. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. And just to explain why I asked that, that question, I thought that, uh, per, that perhaps if, if the same error was present in intactivism and you know, what some of my cousins might be sympathetic to with the idea that children shouldn't be designated a sex at birth, then since these cousins of mine are Jewish, I could say to them, well, if you believe this, that children shouldn't be des have their sex designated at birth, then, th uh, th uh, then um, you're in line with those people who are trying to ban circumcision, and that might cause them to, to you know, reflect more deeply on that they might 
be an error with respect well, to... Well, that's very interesting. In my own advocacy on behalf of uh, uh, Jews who wish to practice uh, circumcision, uh, I have uh, run into uh, a uh, group of uh, rabbis uh, who I, I don't quite know how to label whether they're ultra-reform or reconstruction or their own humanistic Judaism or whatever, that have opted in favor of intactivism. They, they've bought into the basic ideology of intactivism over the traditional Jewish view, and so they favor some practice short of circumcision for the male infant that would substitute for the old practice of circumcision without what they regard as the violent attack uh, on the child. But I'm sure that's still a very small minority view that most within the Jewish community, even if they are not devout and regular in their practice, still believe that that the uh, affirmation of the covenant by uh, circumcision is required. Thank well, you me, very uh, much. Let me add, uh, I want to add one thing for, uh, about Islam, uh, just for people who are wondering, at the time of the declarations, uh, the vote, quite a number of Islamic, well not quite a number, but six is Islamic nations voted for it, including the largest Muslim countries at the time. Um, and they made arguments just like you did about a right vis-a-vis -vis the state. And that's how they justified uh, supporting uh, Article 18. The only Islamic country th that didn't vote for it but abstained was Saudi Arabia. But at the time, uh, well, it wasn't the largest Muslim country. Large ones, e Egypt, Pakistan, Syria, they all voted for it. Stephen, how are we doing? One more question. Do you have somebody you want to work with? Okay. Um, so it, it seems that uh, the theoretical underpinnings of the document, you know, they're based on a lot of different systems. Um, to what extent uh, is, that a, is that a threat in the future that there's not, you know, no. one theoretical underpinning or a strength? To, to what extent is the strength or weakness of it going forward? Uh, I believe it's actually a strength. Um, I do think that uh, it's important that people find a way within their traditions, find resources within their traditions to affirm it. In other words, it can't just be hanging out there, especially with our young people. Uh, because the language of human rights and the principles of human rights are so popular, young people want to be on board. It's cool to be for human rights and so forth. But often uh, it doesn't square with what they will report as their underlying beliefs that there's no such thing as objective truth or what have you. Well, all the different, there may be different traditions which for their own reasons affirm the principles of the Declaration, but all of those believe there is such a thing as objective truth. <laughs> exactly how we know it, what its contours are, what its source is, those are debatable. They believe in the reality of objective moral truth. And I think you have to, uh, to really affirm this, uh, uh, this declaration. So I particularly want to urge our young people, I want to challenge our young people, to think hard about this. Uh, many of you probably have an incoherent position. You've got a kind of meta-ethical view about the nature of truth that can't really support this view that you want to hold on human rights. So if you do want to hold the view on human rights, you need to think more about whether there is a ground an ethical ground, a moral ground for believing that there's a foundation, there's a truth that's there, an, 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 an objective uh, uh, truth. I don't think that, that we will, over the long term, be able to uphold human rights and make progress in the many areas throughout the world, including in our own country, where we need progress uh, on human rights if people lose their faith in truth. So I think part of the project for those of us who do believe in human rights, seriously believe in human rights, who believe in them not because they're popular but because we think they're true, part of the challenge for us and our job is to be more effective in making the case. And I don't mean just, moral, just uh, rhetorically effective. I mean to make the case better, make the stronger case, the strongest possible case for uh, a meta-ethical view that would provide a solid ground for belief in human rights. Uh, let me say that I don't think the program uh, here at Catholic University in human rights could have gotten off to a better start than to have Professor George join us with such a good discussion.
about the meaning and the future of human rights and join me in thanking him. Thank all of you.